towards, I mean, de depending on how it's defined, there's obviously, you have the uh, Geneva Convention, which defines that there's also, uh, you know, the military uh, rule of conduct, uh, military practices that also define torture. Torture in and of itself should not be used as a tool. Um, I have no problem with going on record. As you said, when it's elevated to the, to the notion of policy, what happens is this slippery slope that, that higher-ups within the administration and those that justify, and, and again, we've seen this. It, it happens where it says, well, waterboarding, for example. I'll use that as an example that seems to, be, that seems to have gotten a lot of press uh, lately, this notion of simulated drowning um, used against, uh, if memory serves, three top individuals, a colleague, Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, and I forgot who the third was. Um, but essentially, I think Al Libby. Right. And I, I have it somewhere. But anyway, the notion that it simulated drowning and it produced intelligence that led to at least preventing several other attacks. It really becomes, I mean, we look at it and we try to gauge it from an objective standpoint, as you said, using policies and norms, decency rules within uh, civility and how we act toward one another. But I think. Uh, if you look at it, and, and this is what happens, is I'm asking each of you to look at it subjectively. And the notion of coercion, if, if there's, if there's uh, situations such as uh, sleep management as opposed to sleep deprivation, uh, other different types of tactics that are used that have been, uh, that are certainly approved by the military and other allies as well in wartime situations in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, other nations, uh, pro uh, other um, allies that are also democracies, such as Israel, for example, that uses some of these tactics as well. And again, I'm not necessarily condoning the tactics. I'm simply saying that torture in and of itself, and we're, we're dealing with mental torture, physical torture, yes, we should not institute it to the level of policy. And what happens is, again, it, you're down that slippery slope when you're trying to weigh it against obtaining a vital piece of information that may perhaps prevent another attack. You have to weigh it within your own sense of moral conscious of what is right and wrong. As a nation, do we want to condone that type of behavior? Israel's been dealing with this problem much longer than we have. And the issue that came before the Israeli Supreme Court a couple of years ago is whether if you have a terrorist who knows about the ticking time bomb, can you torture them to find out? Because if you don't do it quick, that bomb's going to go off. And that's the, the normal uh, example that's given. And it went all the way up to the Israeli Supreme Court. The president of the Supreme Court is a Holocaust survivor. His entire family had been wiped out by Nazis. He'd been hidden during World War II, made his way to Palestine and then Israel. He, he knew about terrorism. And his response was, a, an opinion which has been cited the, around the world that basically said, no, we don't torture. Why? Because we're a democracy. And so the question is, well, wait a minute. Does that mean that democracy is supposed to fight the war on terror with its hands tied behind its back? And his answer was, sometimes democracy has to fight the war on terror with one hand tied behind its back, but democracy always has the upper hand. The point I'm making is that we have a lot of ways to find out the truth. We have the Constitution. We have a court of law. We have military and civilian intelligence agencies. We have the police. We have many ways of doing it. Bringing somebody to the point of death and physically torturing them does not have to be one of them. In World War II, waterboarding was prosecuted as a war crime by the United States against Japan, meaning when Japanese soldiers did it to our guys, we said it was a war crime. Can you imagine that, how things have changed? And in World War II, the way that we uh, questioned prisoners of war, Japanese prisoners of war and others, was a model of civ civilized society, meaning that we had people who were professors, who were uh, psychologists, sociologists who could come in, understand their culture, understand their mores, and work on them psychologically. And we were extremely successful in obtaining information in World War II that way. You didn't, don't have to do it with a blunt instrument. It can be done with a scalpel. OK, I have a final question. And actually, I have to turn to Gary for this. Uh, I'm very curious about the case that involves a student at William Patterson College and at university and how that 
relates to the security issue and security policy, if you may. Who knows what posse comitatus means? Anybody ever hear of that? Okay, this is part of the problem, is that we don't have the language. We don't see these things in modern usage, okay? Basically, after the Civil War, after the United States had fought the United States, essentially, and destroyed whole areas of civilian populations and so forth, a law was passed that said, from this point forward, the military cannot conduct law enforcement on American soil, for obvious reasons. You can imagine why they'd want to have that law after the Civil War, right? The police do the law enforcement. The military does things outside of the United States. That was repealed. Did you know that? In, a, in, as, in regard to terrorism, in the late 1990s. And then the Patriot Act and others moved it even for, further than that, so that now, with, with a whimper, not a bang, somehow the federal government has taken 100 years of jurisprudence, turned it on its ear, and has said, you know what, the military can conduct law enforcement in the United States if it's about terrorism. So what happens? Well, what happens is they create a super database called the Talon Database. It is a database that aggregates all of the law enforcement data from all the local, state, and federal law enforcement, and then arrogates it with the military, law, uh, military intelligence, and then the rest of the world. So we have things from Jordan, Egypt, all over, and it's put into one great database. The military then goes out and collects more information and puts it in this database. What's an example of that? Well, William Patterson College was having a, um, a day when military recruiters were coming on campus. The military has a don't ask, don't tell policy, and a lot of people don't agree with it, and therefore there was protests. This is nothing new. Um, what was new was that the military investigators had the uh, kids who were involved in this uh, protest under surveillance. And that, and that information made its way into the military data bank, which is accessible by the military and intelligence arms of all these countries that are fighting the war on terror with us. So basically, these kids who were asserting their First Amendment right we're now being under surveillance by our military, not the police, our military. And the only way we found out about this was because there was a leak. Somehow, some of these records, we don't know how, we imagine somebody got a conscience over there, just kind of made their way onto the internet. We found out that it wasn't just William Patterson College, it was UCLA, it was NYU, it was all over the United States. The ACLU filed Freedom of Information Act requests in every one of those states. We did it here in New Jersey to find out what the military had on these kids. And so far, what the military, the Office of Homeland Security, the FBI, all the places we've sent these things to have said to us is, we'll get back to you. A couple of them, like, like for example, the NYPD and so forth, have said, we don't have nothing, and that's fine. That's what I want to hear. So that's good. So we have gotten some back. I think uh, the local New Jersey people said, no, we have nothing. That's OK. But at the upper, upper level, which is what we keep talking about here in Washington, they're not getting back to us. They're not giving us those answers. And so that's one of the reasons you need uh, an ACLU, a Center for Constitutional Rights. You need, you need activist lawyers. Frankly, forget about all that. You need you to get involved. Because it can't just be us. It's got to be you as well. It's got to be the people who are asleep at the switch, the people who are at home seeing all this happen, and nobody's getting up and saying, wait a minute. <laughs> you know? That's the problem. It's you, not us, that has to get involved. On that, yes. Uh, because earlier we, it was mentioned about how the global war on terrorism isn't working. Actually, it was mentioned that it's not working. Um, quantitatively, we're, law enforcement, us as Americans, we're at a, uh, a real challenge because we have to be right 100% of the time. The bad guys only have to be right once to be successful. Um, I live in New York City. I lived there my entire life. My wife worked in one of the targeted buildings during the 2004 financial sector threat against financial institutions. Um, actually, my wife worked at Deutsche Bank right across the street from the World Trade Center, and we took off that day for our house closing on September 11th. Um, and then I went into, I gave a power of attorney, I went into work that day. Um, but has anybody heard of the Brooklyn Bridge plot to take down the Brooklyn Bridge? Iman Farris. Iman Farris. I don't know, was that a win for us? Taking out the Brooklyn Bridge? How many daily commuters? I don't know, was, would you say that's a win or a loss for us? <laughs> this is like class, trying to get somebody to raise an answer. <laughs> <laughs> was it a win for us? What, what do you think the devastating impact on taking out the Brooklyn Bridge would would have been to New York again and to the region, if not the country. Um, anybody hear about the Herald Square plot? Mm -hmm. 
to bomb during the Republican 